Hello, and welcome to this week's COP Conversation, the series of events that we're holding online through Oxford University's Public Affairs Directorate to commemorate and mark the fact that in just a few weeks' time, we will be holding the globally significant COP26 summit here in the UK in Glasgow. My name is Rana Mitter. I teach Chinese politics and history here at Oxford. My role here today is to host our speaker, who is going to be starting and indeed leading our COP conversation today. It starts, in a sense, today's uh, conversation in 1992, when countries promised in international law to prevent dangerous changes in the Earth's climate. And since 1995, almost every country on Earth has been coming together for COPS. And just in case you didn't know, it stands for Conference of the Parties. Global climate, chum, uh, global climate summits, which are designed to meet the promises made in those early days. This year is going to be annual summit number 26. And UK is president uh, with, as I said, uh, the event at Glasgow. As the first major COP since the landmark 2015 Paris Agreement, there's a unique urgency to this particular meeting. We're all asking what do countries and cities and businesses and all of us individually need to do? And are people going to step up? Well, the man who I hope can answer at least some of those questions is very much with us today. And that is Dr. Thomas Hale, Associate Professor in Global Public Policy at the Blavatnik School of Government right here in Oxford. Thomas's research explores how we can manage transnational problems effectively and fairly with a particular emphasis on environmental, economic and health issues. And uh, Thomas' books include Transnational Climate Change Governance and also Gridlock, Why Global Cooperation is Failing When We Need It Most. So very much to the point for today. Uh, in a moment, I'm gonna introduce him to speak. He's going to speak for about 15 minutes, and as usual, we'll have about 15 minutes for questions. Please send in lots of questions. We'd love to get your questions from wherever you are in the world. There's a chat window if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, there's a comment section if you're on Twitter or Facebook. Whatever mode you're in, send in the questions. Do remember we're all still doing this on Wi-Fi, perhaps from homes or slightly unreliable offices or whatever. So if there's a sudden glitch, bear with us. We'll try and get back as soon as possible. But I think we're going to have a really educative and also informative half hour. So without any delay, Tom. Over to you. Thank you so much, Rana, for that kind introduction. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. So I'm going to offer a few thoughts on what we might need from COP26, but as Rana said, I'm really interested in the questions and ideas you might have for what you think we need from COP26. So where have we come from and where are we going next? Well, as Rana said, we promised, we being all the countries in the world, collectively in international law in 1992 to prevent dangerous changes in the Earth's climate. And since then, we've met again and 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 we've often not had much success and if we didn't meet last year because of covid glasgow was meant to take place in 2020 but it'll be taking place in 2021. in the meantime we've of course seen that annual emissions of greenhouse gases including carbon dioxide and others have grown from about 23 billion tons when that promise was made in 1992 to something like 37 billion tons today so that's a huge uh, challenge that we need to now think about how we flatten this curve and move to a world um, of 1.5 degrees, limiting climate change to no more than 1.5 degrees. And that curve looks more like this, st starting with a, a plateau and a flattening of our current level of emissions, and then radically reducing them in the next decade, in the decade after that, and in the decade after that, all the way down to zero, um, to net zero, which is where we know we need to go if we want to limit further warming of the planet. So that's where we've come from, and that's the challenge before us now. And COP26 is really coming at a critical time for how we make this flattening of the curve happen. And I wanna say in the next few minutes that we need three things from this COP. We need a ratchet, we need to ratchet greenhouse gases down and ratchet money up. We need rules for how we're going to implement this new agreement we got in Paris in 2015, and we need transformation. And indeed that transformation has to look far beyond what governments are doing across all of society as well. So let me start with the first one of those, the ratchet. So in Paris, we have this new system emerge for how we think about solving big global collective action problems like climate. And you can think about this system as a pledge, review, and ratchet system. So in those previous COPs, a lot of them were dedicated to trying to negotiate what you might call a global deal that would prescribe this country should do that much, this country should do this much, and together that would add up to hopefully a big reduction. Instead, Paris creates a more iterative model where countries make different pledges, signing their nationally determined contributions or NDCs, what they say they can do in the next five or 10 years. 
And then we review those at regular intervals. We review the implementation of the previous pledges, but we also review the adequacy of all the pledges together. Are they adding up to the goals that we've set? And critically, and this is the most important part for Glasgow, we ratchet those pledges up over time. So in, in theory, the system should help us to start from a low base to move upward toward the ambition we know we need to get to. And overall, we can think about this shift as something from a change from a regulatory regime. In other words, kind of prescribe what countries should do in a green, kind of a common document, a treaty, what that should be, to this more, we might call a catalytic regime, which is about trying to solve the collective action problem, not by getting everyone to sign on that line altogether, but rather to try to create a, a sort of um, critical mass of action over time and to scale that up progressively. So this is a really important and big shift. And Glasgow is particularly important because it's the first time we're testing this third and critical piece of the Paris regime, the ratchet piece. So what does that look like now? How are we doing with the ratcheting? Well, as of this morning, when I last checked, we've seen actually 139 of 196 or so parties to the UN process uh, have put forward a new or updated nationally determined contribution or NDC. That's the good news. The less good news is that unfortunately only about 81 of them really represent a meaningful submission, a, a meaningful progression of their ambition from the previous round, the round that was put forward in Paris. So we have a number of countries for example, Mexico or Brazil, which haven't yet put forward a new ambitious plan. They've put forward um, a pretty weak one. However, there's hope. So there's 34 countries that have said they're going to enhance their ambition and a number of countries that haven't said one way or the other what they're going to do. And those countries still on the fence, if you were, include some pretty big ones, including the world's largest emitter, China, the world's third largest emitter, India, countries like Australia, countries like Saudi Arabia, all might be in the realm of putting together some upgraded emissions, upgraded, upgraded pledges in the next few weeks. And so that's what we're really watching right now. We're also seeing a lot of countries come forward with net zero targets, which are looking beyond the kind of five to 10 year plan uh, span of the Paris Agreement pledges, but are giving us an important direction of travel to work for over time. And indeed something like countries that add up to 80% of global GDP now have these kinds of net zero pledges. We need to see them reflected, not just in long-term plans, but in the short-term action under these Paris pledges as well. From the emissions landscape, we know that we have more work to do though, because these pledges that I've mentioned are putting us into a path of still rising emissions. This is the latest information from the UN. This is a synthesis report that includes those NDCs that had come in by a month ago when this last report was done in September. And it shows that the current NDCs, uh, the ones that were current as of September, are still leading to something like a 16% rise in emissions by 2030. We actually know we need to bring that radically down. So these last few NDCs that are still in play, which are, as I said, some of the really big ones, need to go a lot further to be able to help us get from where we are now, a trajectory toward higher degrees to a, a slightly, um, a pretty radical flattening of this curve. So ones that we're gonna be watching for in the next few, few weeks, as I said, are like India, China, um, Saudi Arabia, and we'll also be looking to see if some of the ones who've already put forward one of those plans might upgrade them a bit more on this in these last intense moments of diplomacy taking place now. That's really important because it means that we need to, we need to absolutely make sure that this ratchet holds the promise of keeping our goals alive, keeping the 1.5 degree goal, which is the ambitious goal set out in the, in the Paris Agreement, alive in the next round. And that's gonna require a lot of work. But you know, the question then is how much ratchet needs to happen to really make it a success? And that's a hard question to answer. And I think no one really expected it, this round of ratcheting to get us all the way there. But what it really needs to do is to show that this Paris mechanism is working, that's actually raising ambition over time, and it's going to help us avoid the worst impacts of climate change. Because the truth is that every single fraction of a degree really matters. This is the nature of climate policy. And so every single molecule of carbon is worth fighting for. But as I mentioned, the ratchet doesn't only include ratcheting down greenhouse gases. It also includes ratcheting up the thing that's gonna help us achieve this transition. And one of the core things that's gonna help us achieve it is money. So in 2010, the rich countries in the world promised that they would mobilize 100 billion US dollars every year by 2020 and beyond for developing countries to help them with transition. And this data here, it shows you how we've done on that target so far. And as you can see, in the latest round, we're still about 20% off that target, about 80 billion perhaps has been mobilized so far. So there's been a huge amount of pressure on countries to raise their ambition on finance in the last few months. We're seeing some new pledges, for example, from the United States or from Italy, but we still have more to do. So this is another key ratchet that we're gonna to need to see 
in Glasgow to have the, um, the, the structure we've built in Paris begin to show its success. So ratcheting is probably the thing people are most focused on. But another important aspect that we're looking for in Glasgow is rules. So the Paris Agreement was negotiated in 2015. It set out the structure that I described with its pledge and review and ratchet system, and it has lots of technical details in that about how the pledges look, how the ratcheting works, how the transparency around the review process works. But some of those rules haven't yet been finalized. So there's a few things still to negotiate in Glasgow to finalize the system. Um, most of this was done in COP24, which took place in 2018 in Katowice, Poland. And that was a big success in the sense that a lot of it was agreed then. This is the Polish uh, minister at the time who was presiding over the COP, leaping over the stage in his excitement at the very end, having got to most of the work. But in truth, there were still a few things left on the table. And two of the big ones are on emissions trading and common timeframes. So the emissions trading, which is called Article 6 under the Paris Agreement, is about how reductions in one country might be used to help other countries um, achieve their goals. So for example, here in the UK, there's a very ambitious 2050 net zero target, but there might be some possibility of the UK supporting other countries to help uh, reduce their emissions. And some of those transfers perhaps could be um, counted for in the UK system. That's the idea anyway. But there's obviously huge complexities around those kinds of transfers. Are they doing the accounting right? Is it really additional? Is it credible? And so strong rules around that are really critical to make sure that this pledge and review and ratchet system has real integrity if it involves transfers across countries. Another important thing is the time frame for which the ratcheting should occur. So even though ratcheting overall will occur every five years, this one in Glasgow, of course, this year is uh, one year off from what it should have been because of COVID, but um, 2020 slash 2021 is the first ratchet, the next one will be in 2025, 2030, et cetera. But some countries are of the view that they should ratchet every 10 years, not every five years. Uh, and so this is a big question um, on the table in Glasgow as well. There's a number of other more technical rules that are also really important to ensure that the system has integrity going forward. So the first one is ratchet, the second one is rules, but the final one is maybe even the most important of all, which is about transformation. Because even though COPs are you know, really about what governments are doing, it's an intergovernmental intergovernment, inter meeting of the UN where sovereign states negotiate with each other, we know that climate change isn't going to be solved by governments alone. It's a systems-wide transformation that we need. And what's really interesting is that the UN system has, in the last few years, really embraced this kind of all of society approach and really has reached out to cities, to businesses, to investors, to civil society, to others to try to mobilize more action across the board. So what we have, we'll see this very much in display in Glasgow, a few of the kind of key campaigns that we'll be hearing about at COP26 are uh, about mobilizing these different actors to take more action on mitigation, on reducing emissions, on building up resilience and adapting to climate change, and of course, financing its transition. So the mitigation focus campaign is called Race to Zero, and it's a big campaign to get net zero targets from a whole different range of actors, but also to make sure those net zero targets are paired with immediate action for reducing emissions by 2030 in this decade. Um, race resilience is about trying to mobilize support for 4 billion people by the end of this decade to help them adapt to the effects of climate change. And the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, or GFANS, is about trying to shift the entire financial system to a Paris compliant model. So these are big efforts. And indeed, they've elicited a lot of attention from huge swaths of the business world, of cities, of regions, of other parts of society. If you add up all the businesses involved, you get something like $8 trillion in annual revenue. If you add up all the cities and regions, it's something like 10% of the world population. If you add up all the financial institutions, we're talking something like 90 trillion US dollars of assets under management. So together, these cities and businesses and regions, these subnational and non-state actors are really collectively a climate superpower. And in terms of emissions, in terms of money, in terms of their actual influence on the levels of change, they can really drive a whole lot of transformation. And so what's really interesting is to see this on display in COP26 and how many more cities, how many more businesses, how many more financial institutions will add to these important campaigns. This is all in the UN system embraced under a banner called the Marrakesh Partnership for Global Climate Action, which was created at COP22, which took place in Morocco in 2016. Um, and this is really important for the transformations that we're going to need to see over the next few decades. But it's not only about mobilizing actors to take on mitigation or adaptation goals, it's also about diving deeper into some of the more specific problems that we know we have to solve to achieve those higher level targets. So we're gonna see a lot of focus on different sectoral breakthroughs at COP as well. And we need to see real advances here if those high level emissions targets or adaptation goals are gonna be credible. 
For example, we want to see it cup and end to coal, as a clear pathway toward ending coal as the primary source of energy, which it is still for many parts of the world. That's a, uh, a super important one because we know the time frame for new coal investments, for example, those you know, coal plant built today will last for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And that time is not time we have. We're also gonna see a huge focus, for example, on nature and so-called nature-based solutions using uh, reforestation, using enhancing integrity of different uh, land use systems to try to address some of the impacts of climate change, but also to help us with the mitigation challenge that we know we have, and critically to stop deforestation, which is a major driver of climate change. We're also gonna see a lot of efforts around clean transport, so electric vehicle campaigns, asking countries and other kinds of actors to come forward with targets, say for 2030 or 2035 to phase out fossil fuel powered vehicles, and a lot of information and pledges and targets and achievements around uh, different kinds of industrial transformations. So for example, this year we had for the first time a steel plant producing steel without any fossil fuels, entirely clean energy. And that's a really important kind of transformation that now needs to be scaled up worldwide. So a clear focus of COP is not just gonna be the high level emissions and resilience targets and the finance targets, but also on the more concrete granular sectoral transformation, sectoral breakthroughs that are needed to achieve those. Well, it's really exciting, actually. And this is the part that makes me a bit hopeful, even though you know we're not in a context of um, we're in a really difficult context around it. The hope is that some of these initiatives around, for example, the sectoral transformations or those that involve cities or businesses or other kinds of actors, these have a lot of potential to really help us get to that seemingly exotic goal of, of flattening the emissions curve in this decade. So this is a graph showing some analysis from a report we did earlier this year, looking at um, about two dozen of the biggest of these kinds of sectoral initiatives. And um, without going into all the details, you can see the emissions curve on the, on the left-hand side with all the different potential options we have. And the bar on the right-hand side, the green bar, number two, shows how much potential these kinds of initiatives have to reduce emissions if we implement them fully. And as you can see, we're talking not just you know, a little drop in the pond here, we're talking about three or six or nine or 12 or at the most 15 billion tons of carbon by 2030. So these are really some powerful levers that we could pull at COP26. Final thought to leave you on, this whole shit system that we've been describing about getting this ratcheting going, getting the review, getting all of this society involved, it's really about trying to a, a larger shift in the climate regime from a focus on just negotiations between countries to what you might think of as the ambition action loop. Because really what we're trying to drive is of course a system of transformation. And so what we need to create is some sort of flywheel where targets lead to action, action gets implemented on the ground, that implementation unlocks possibilities for higher ambition going forward, which then in turn results in higher targets. That system, that spinning cycle, that loop of ambition and action is exactly what Glasgow needs to catalyze to make sure that in this next critical decade, where we absolutely must flatten this emissions curve, we're getting the kinds of breakthroughs we need. And that's of course gonna be a job for governments, but it's also gonna be a job for all other parts of society, for cities, for regions, for businesses, for finance, for us in academia and researchers, for citizens, for civil society. We all have a part to play in that. So Glasgow will have all of that on offer. It's going to be, I think, very much in the balance to quite toward the end, how effective it's going to be, how successful we're going to be, but there's a lot to play for. So it's very much worth trying. So three things we need from Glasgow, ratchet, rules, and transformation. That's gonna be what's on the table in this menu on the banks of the River Clyde in a few weeks time, and the stakes cannot be higher. Those are my quick thoughts, Rana. Looking forward to the questions. Thanks very much indeed, Tom. Uh, quick uh, in terms of time covered, but in terms of range, very, very deep as well as broad. And we'd be getting, you know, as you can imagine, a huge number of questions actually just flying in as you've been speaking. So I think people from all sorts of places actually are really uh, engaged. So the best thing I think can do of is, is take advantage of you for another quarter an hour or so and start putting some of these thoughts to you. Because I think a lot of people want to, to share uh, uh, um, the uh, the import of some of these uh, some of these questions. Let's um, start, if I may, with uh, a question that comes in from Hannah S, who starts with an excellent line. Hannah says, "This is a truly brilliant presentation. Thank you." So we're starting on the right note already. But her question is, "Are OECD countries slash Annex Two countries, um, are you obviously in the upper echelons of of GDP?" contributing enough financially to the mitigation and adaptation measures that need to be undertaken in developing countries? And are the policies around that mechanism strong and binding enough? Is climate justice actually being done? 
will historical emissions be taken into consideration at the COP? So there's actually quite a few questions, but they're very pointed and good ones. So thank you, Hannah. Let me throw that to you as a sort of starter, if I may, Tom. Thanks for the question, Hannah. So as you uh, point out in, in the tone of your question, absolutely, we're not there yet. And that's where Glasgow is so important to try to create a higher level of contribution here. Um, so the figures I showed earlier were from the OECD. The OECD counts climate finance in a particular way. And because the OECD is a club of richer countries, its incentive is to count finance in a way that makes those countries seem like they're very generous. Um, India actually did its own assessment recently of a few years ago of um, how much climate finance had thought. And the difference was something like three, three um, times three less. So it was uh, you know, the the, one of the problems of the definition of climate finance isn't particularly clear and different actors have different political incentives to define it in different ways. That's the kind of context in the UN debates, but the broader picture is really important here because counting at billions is important. It's essential for justice. It's essential for maintaining trust in this multilateral process. So we absolutely have to get this, um, this 100 billion delivered and go beyond it uh, going forward. But to actually fully support developing countries and indeed all of us to transition will take trillions, not billions. So it's actually about shifting the entire financial system away from supporting a mix of green and brown sort of sources to actually going entirely green with our financial flows. So that's a bigger transformation than one that we're seeing, you know, the seeds have emerged, for example, in this Glasgow Finance Alliance. So there's a lot more to be done on that front. In terms of justice, it's going to be absolutely necessary to invest more in that going forward. And so I think that's going to be very much front and center of the COP. Thanks, uh, Tom. Well, there's several questions that are on a similar theme, so I'm going to put them together and put them to you as sort of as a combo question, so to uh, to speak. Um, one version comes in from Dia, and Dia asks, what's the last COP before it's too late? Is it this one? Sarah L asks, why is Glasgow spoken of as a last chance if there's a meeting next year? And I think, in fact, the very first question that came in, even you know, when you were just a few minutes into speaking, comes from Ella. And Ella asks, I know about Paris, but did any of these others make a difference. So there is a pretty apocalyptic discourse going on around Glasgow. Some of that obviously is, is hype to make people concentrate and bring their minds together, but also this wider sense that actually a lot of the numbers that need to be changed may be difficult to fix after this one. And as you pointed out from your chart, an awful lot of previous COP meetings, which did not make much of a splash in the world media, unlike Paris, unlike Copenhagen, unlike Glasgow is, is doing. So could you drill down into that question a bit more for us? How, how final is this final chance? Great question. So I think one of the ways to think about climate change requires us to hold different ideas that are seemingly contradictory in our head at the same time. Um, and this is very much re relevant for this question because in some ways we've had huge progress. Before Paris, the world was on an exponentially rising emissions curve. Emissions were growing out of control. We're on track for a three or four or even five degree world. That would be an unmitigated, literally, disaster. Paris was able to, uh, the pledges that came in around Paris were able to move that from an exponential curve to something a bit more linear. Still growing, still not going the way we need, but a much better world, maybe a you know, three-ish degree world uh, was, was the outcome there. So that's progress, but obviously it's nowhere near where we need to go, which is a 1.5 degree world. Well, Paris said well below two as a requirement and ideally 1.5. So we're now in this sort of phase where can we go from, you know, we've gone from exponential to linear, can we go from linear to flat and then quickly from flat to rapid decrease? That's the, the king. So the point though is that, as I said, every single fraction of degree matters. The world is very different at 1.5 versus 1.6 versus two. And so if we can get as close as possible, as low as possible, that's success. Um, and you know, we've already warned the world by 1.1 degrees. So in some ways it's already too late, right? We've, we've already allowed climate change to occur, but that shouldn't be a cause for despair. Rather, I think it's a cause for urgency because really every single molecule of carbon matters and we should, we should think about it in that way. Um, can it be, you know, if Glasgow doesn't uh, deliver um, 1.5, I don't think that's a failure. I think it's a, a, you know, consistent with what our expectations would have been. I think it has to keep 1.5 alive. If it gives up on what this, the possibility of maintaining the Paris goal, that will indeed be a big blow. That's why there's so much to play for in the next few weeks. Okay, well, let me now put in a question which comes in from Lawrence Need, but it's dear to my heart as a China specialist. So it is, uh, well, Lawrence's question is, how will the West tensions with China play out in COP26? And 
I'd add on top of that, and I think Lauren's probably aware as well, that just within the last few days, it's been announced that in response to the current global energy crisis, which is yet another thing which, of course, is, is um, uh, occupying great many of us around the world at the at the moment, China has announced it's going to turn many of the coal-fired stations back up to maximum uh, to make sure that there is as little a gap as possible in terms of energy provision for industry and homes, but once again, pouring huge amounts of carbon into the atmosphere well beyond China's borders. So the China question, obviously central to the way in which this is going to work out, add to that US-China tensions as another element in the in the mix. I mean, Tom, is, is that something where you see any of these, these gleams of hope you've been talking about, or is this one really going to be too hard for us to handle? So again, I think it requires to, us to hold different competing um, ideas in our head at the same time. There's a lot of positive stuff going on here. So China has now committed to a 2060 net zero goal. That was uh, the case after uh, it was made last year. It's committed to eliminate external uh, financing for coal abroad. That's also a very positive step. Um, but at the same time, the biggest single source of emissions in the world is China's domestic fleet of coal plants, about you know, a thousand billion tons of, of carbon, uh, of, of um, energy capacity in those domestic in that domestic coal fleet. The current energy crisis is, a, is a, exactly a symptom of why China, though, needs to transition as rapidly as it can. It's showing just how dependent China is on this somewhat unreliable source. Diversification to renewables will put China in a much more energy secure future, which is why we see these hugely ambitious renewable energy targets from the Chinese government. It's very much in China's interest to mobilize the, the investments that will need to be able to wean itself off coal for only, if only for energy security reasons, not even thinking about climate change, obviously there's major health benefits as well. So, you know, I think the, I, I see the current energy crisis as a very, sort of a short-term symptom of this longer term structural addiction to coal and therefore not super relevant in the transition question, um, but maybe relevant around COP26 because the timing is quite conjunctural. More generally though, you know, we were off, we would have normally expected uh, President Xi Jinping to join the world leader mm. in Glasgow, and also to, for him to join the G20 meeting taking place immediately before Glasgow. It looks like that's not happening. He hasn't left China um, since COVID began. It's not likely to do so anytime soon. So I think some of that leader level commitment to move some of the grease the wheels of negotiation, grease the wheels of a commitment is, is very much um, uh, impacted by that, by that choice. Final thing on this point though, I would be surprised if we didn't hear anything new from China in the next few weeks. I think there's a um, huge, huge focus on uh, China's role in the world at the moment, and China has a lot of positive contributions it can make. It's held a lot of its cards back until this point. So I'd be very surprised if we didn't see anything further. Semper aliquid novi ex sina, as our prime minister might have said in a slight adaptation, always something new out of China. Um, let me, as we begin to come to the end of our time, Tom, bring together again a few questions. I can't stress, oh gosh, there's more coming in even now. This is really grabbing people's attention. Uh, a couple of questions which center on one particular issue, which is forward-looking policy, which I think is obviously what we want to think about, um, and particularly the relationship, again, of the richer countries and the less rich countries. Let me pull together a few of these um, points because they all center on the same thing. One from uh, Mateo Mikosic, who asks, uh, what further actions could the US government take to be a better ally to developing countries ahead of COP26? Curious to hear about, e.g., bilateral, multilateral initiatives to join climate finance, etc. And I could expand that to say it doesn't have just have the US, it could be, you know, OECD, Western world more broadly. Let me pull that in together with another couple of related ones. Um, here's one from Alice Luca. Alice asks, how will COP26 engage with MNCs, multinational corporations, who have a huge responsibility in how their activity impacts climate change, but it requires international coordination in order to apply uh, evenly to apply globals, uh, global sanctions. Um, and a final one in that list from Lenny Leung. Lenny asks, for countries with ecological capacity to critical to combat climate change, e.g. Brazil, Indonesia, is it possible to increase the involvement of the international community in conservation efforts? And actually one more, which is just the same thing. So that's Kwadong from, uh, I, uh, yeah, coming in just right, right now, from many developed countries, for many developed countries, which have to struggle a lot because of climate change. I think actually developing countries, possibly what Ko is getting at, um, which have to struggle a lot because of climate change. What things do these countries have to do to improve that solution? So it's actually four, but very much in the same part of the, we hope ecologically preserved forest. So let me put them to you as a, as a combo there, Tom. Great, let me start with the, the last one. Um, you know, 
the tragedy of climate change is that those who have contributed least to the problem are also the ones who suffer most from it. And that's a, a moral failure. It's a moral catastrophe. You know, we've, we've now in the COVID era seen plenty of examples of this, but it's a particularly sharp one. And we'll, it's not one that we can quickly immediately turn around or solve. Um, that's, um, that's the bad news. The good news though is that developing countries, I think are, many you know, developing countries are exercising extraordinary foresight, vision, leadership in this space. For example, there's a group of 40 countries called the Climate Vulnerable Forum, which are the most vulnerable countries to climate change. They've said that they're going to go to 100% renewable energy by, 20, by 2040, I believe. Um, not because they you know, are trying to um, you know, make it, uh, not, not because it's sort of easy, but because they want to show the leadership of how they're going to, this, this transition should go. And so if they can set that kind of target, there's really no excuse for richer countries to, to hold back. Um, the United States is uh, one of the laggards in climate finance globally. The Biden administration has now said just recently that it's going to triple its contribution, that even so with that tripling, it would put it um, still sort of toward the lower middle of the um, lead table in terms of how, many, how much money rich countries are giving us, percentage of their, of their economy. So the US needs to do more. That relies a lot on Congress, and the US Congress is not working particularly effectively at the moment, as you might have noticed. So this is a really important challenge that um, we need to um, focus on. But there's other things we can do as well. For example, in the United States, there's huge ability to leverage the private sector more effectively um, to create some, some more direct capital flows into developing countries to get from the billions to the trillions. So I think there's some real opportunities there to, to go for. Um, on the forestry question, this is really important you know, for the world, of course, is simultaneously, simultaneously true that for the world, the Amazon rainforest is an essential global public good. It's also true that for Brazilian farmers or for indigenous people living in the forest or for people or the Brazilian state, this is an essential national resource. And that tension is really difficult to navigate. So we need to find strategies and we have some, good, some pretty good tools for how international transfers can be used to support positive forest economic activities in countries like Brazil. The current leadership of Brazil is not um, been, shall we say, at the forefront of trying to make that happen, but there's plenty of good examples in Brazil and other parts of the world where these kinds of um, deals are being done. One really good one that came out recently was between Switzerland and Colombia, where a huge Swiss investment into Colombia's uh, natural resource restoration efforts paid for by Swiss money, but then Swiss, Switzerland can count that against its own climate mitigation targets. So those are the kinds of deals we need to see more of, and they need to be done in a way that's not sort of rich countries buying indulgences from the developing world, but really kind of co-created and owned and led by the people who are living in the places that are affected by them. So we can do stuff. I think that's the core message here. There's not, it's not all doom, it's not all despair, but it's gonna take hard work and that's what we need to get going on in Glasgow. So thanks for that. We're really beginning to come um, sadly to the end of our time, but I want to just throw in a last question for you to lead us out before we wrap up. And I'd like to uh, you know thank everyone for sending in so many questions. I just wish we had more, more time. Um, us and the planet both, I guess. Um, so the final thing, I suppose, is that we're talking here, and this is your expertise at the, the BSG, about, you know, international organisations, a huge sort of transnational set of bodies, and it can make individuals feel very powerless, in a sense, the idea that, you know, doing a bit of recycling here or a bit of, you know, sort of small scale mitigation there doesn't really make that much difference, even though you very, you know, kind of repeatedly and cheerfully said, you know, every carbon molecule counts. Is there a sense in which individuals can feel some genuine sense of agency or empowerment about this immensely important issue where it seems that individual effort is often, you know, almost lost in the wind um, as we think about these huge forces that are going to be in play at Glasgow and beyond. I think it comes back to this idea of holding two different ideas in your head at the same time, because it's both you know, simultaneously true that we are all individual drops in the ocean. So what we do doesn't really matter, but collectively we are the only things that matter. We're, there's nothing else but us that matters in fact. So, uh, you know, people often put this as sort of a, well, it doesn't really matter what you do individually because you're only so small, but I think that's not right. And I think we've all seen that in our own lives with the COVID crisis over the past few years. You know, it's only through people taking actions together that all of them were able to collectively flatten the curve for disease spread. And that kind of solidarity, that kind of common norm, that's only created through individual action. So it's not sort of a false dichotomy to see this as a pose in my view. So I think the things people can do are very important to reduce your own carbon footprint, but of course also to make sure that you are expressing your views to your political leaders about what you think the planet should be moving toward, expressing your views to the companies you purchase your services from, your pension funds, your banks, 
all of these need to hear from you on what we can do. And so taking agency over your own life is really fits nicely with also exercising your voice as a citizen, as a consumer, as a person who has to live on this planet for the next however many years uh, to make sure it's going in the right direction. So yeah, Glasgow will be a moment for all of us to um, not sit back and say, oh, country should have done that. There'll be a chance to say, country should do this and here's how we're gonna work together to make it happen. Tom, thanks for that. A bit of housekeeping to just finish us off before we bring a final uh, conclusion to today's uh, event. Uh, just uh, thanks, first of all, to our audience from around the world who, as ever, have been very loyal in tuning in for today's session and also the many watching on playback around the world. And reminder, if that's the way that you access our COP conversations, then you can find links to all the previous talks via the web page listed in the description just below the video. So do check all of them out. And next week, in a week's time from now, in fact, at 12.45 British time, uh, till 1.15, we will have a talk on why net zero and what is it? I mean, two very important uh, parts of that question. And that'll be with um, Oxford academic, as ever, Professor Sam Fankhauser. So that's Thursday, 21st of October, 12.45 to 1.15. But for today, I think we have to really be immensely grateful to our speaker for such a clear, concise, and I think in many ways, hopeful account of what is often and really very overwhelming seeming, but utterly urgent set of issues. So can we please give our thanks to Dr. Tom Hale, and let us also uh, pledge that we will not only do something about climate change, but also gather again next week. Thank you very much to everyone for joining us today for this Oxford COP conversation. <laughs>